he did double duty for us this time and filling in where we had a cancellation and we appreciate that very much. Uh, he's been a dear friend for many, many years. And the thing that makes so much difference, and he's not the only one, it's good, I think, to say this now about several of you and others, that it's great to have good friends, but the friends become even more cherished when your views, right and wrong, are coming from the same direction, the infallible standard of truth that is the Bible, and willing to make sacrifices at any cost to stay true to the good book. That's what we appreciate so much about Michael and a number of others. And we want him to come to us now at this time on by what authority does one church withdraw fellowship from a sister church? Brother Michael, come speak to us, please. I appreciate the opportunity to be here again and to be able to speak on this fine lectureship. I appreciate the elders and David, the good work that's done here. Appreciate all of those that work so hard behind the scenes as well. Those who have been cooking and fixing food for us, uh, it is greatly appreciated. In spite of all the pounds that it put on, but uh, it is greatly appreciated. Appreciate uh, appreciate this subject. It's an important subject. I've been falsely accused at times of even holding the opposite view. It wasn't true then. It is scriptural for one congregation to withdraw from a sister congregation. But to say that isn't worth much unless we can back it up with God's Word. It's clearly obvious from the Scriptures that we are to withdraw, a congregation is to withdraw fellowship from certain individuals. Uh, 1 Corinthians 5, 2 Thessalonians 3, and other passages uh, clearly teach that question is, though, what about congregations from another congregation? And I'm going to skip over some of the parts that are in the book dealing with uh, how we ascertain Bible authority, but I will make mention of one thing, that there is an omission in the book, I believe, in my chapter, and it's not their fault or those who proof the book, it's my fault. If you're reading uh, the quote that I had from Roy Beaver dealing with implication, I left part of it out. It's kind of obvious because as I was reading it at uh, home and they said, you left out part D on that uh, as far as the implications and what we know in relationship to a figure. So. I looked, and yes, I left it out of the manuscript as well. So that's my fault. Uh, it's probably quoted elsewhere. But we do assert Bible authority from direct statements, from implication, and from examples. We don't have a direct statement that states one congregation is to withdraw from another congregation. Is it implied in the scriptures? And that's really what we have to deal with. And when you come to many of the scriptures that we're going to look at this morning, obviously it becomes a matter of fact that it is. One of the lessons that was presented earlier this week, Brother uh, Darrell Broking presented a lesson on the fact that congregations can extend a ship to another congregation. It has to be established first because if you cannot extend fellowship, you cannot withdraw fellowship. Well, Darrell Broken did an excellent job in dealing with that subject, so we're not really going to go that again. But with that standing, consider this. Here's the Spring Church of Christ. It is faithful to the Lord 
doing what it's supposed to do. And here's the uncongregation, Church of Christ. It's doing what it's supposed to do. It's following the Lord, walking in the light. But the unspring congregation hires a new man. And this, un, this new man at the unspring congregation begins to make a few changes here and there. And they start things a little bit differently. They start talking a little, a little differently. And then they want to get the kids off into another room during the service because some of the kids are interrupting services to start a children's church. Then they start clapping uh, after baptisms first, of course, and then let it spill over into after songs and after a sermon that they like, they applaud the sermon and things such as that. Things go on. They finally bring in the instrument of music into the worship service of the Lord's Church. They start adding other innovations and changing. Now then, what's the spring congregation to do in relationship to that unspring congregation? These two congregations had fellowship. They extended fellowship to each other. They even engaged in joint participation. Let's just say that the Unspring congregation had sent money to help in support of this lectureship and other works that the congregation here was involved in. But now then, they've changed. They're not the same as they were before. But, of course, they keep that sign up there to Christ. It's Cola, Florida. The Bellevue elders, this was before I moved there, talked to another eldership that was in town. And that eldership made the statement that they would ship anyone who has the term Church of Christ on its building. Daniel Dunn's back there shaking his head. He uh, probably knows exactly what I'm talking about, the congregation that I'm talking about. But let's go a little bit farther in this scenario of the unspring congregation in connection with the spring congregation. Let's just say that someone comes into this congregation and says, starts promoting the fact, well, it's wrong to withdraw fellowship from another congregation. There's nothing good about that. Now then, here's a town. Those that, here's the congregations, the spring congregation and the unspring congregation, that have fellowship, they're both churches of Christ, they are the same thing. And now then this unspring congregation gets out and they start promoting and advocating all of these things. They're teaching error on marriage, divorce, and remarriage. They're having their children's worship. They're having their instrumental music and so forth and so on. And we could go down a long list of items, couldn't we? Here's old Joe Blow out in town. He sees those two congregations. Why, well, those two congregations must be that search of Christ on the building. Satan has gained an advantage in that situation. But let's go on. Taking the this one who advocated that they would fellowship anyone as long as they had Church of Christ on their building. And so at this unspring congregation, some individuals come in and they start making some other changes. And it becomes a Muslim mosque that they keep Church of Christ on the building. They just don't take the time to rip the sign off. 
Look at what you've placed yourself and the situation you have placed yourself because that was an illustration that the Bellevue elders used with that eldership. And it was at, at that point in time that they said as long as it has Church of Christ on the building, they would fellowship. What an ungodly position you've used yourself in. That's this view, though, that one congregation cannot withdraw fellowship from another congregation. Satan has certainly gained an advantage, truth and righteousness. But in reality, if we go back a century, latter part of the 18th and early part of 19th century, is that exactly what happened? Had the, what became the Christian church officially recognized in 1906 as a division between the churches of Christ and the Christian church? But what was happening? Here's the Christian church basically taking over churches of Christ, keeping the signs, and in many places today, they still have the sign up there, Churches of Christ. Are we in fellowship with them? Brethren, if we cannot withdraw fellowship from another congregation, then we better go back and jive to all of those in the Christian church for withdrawing fellowship from them. Not only should we apologize to them, we better start fellowshipping them and engaging in joint activities and in joint participations with all those individuals and those congregations. If not, why not? But also, let's go back a little farther. During the first century, there was an apostasy that took place. During that first century, uh, all of the congregations were were churches of Christ. But there was an apostasy that did take place. If one congregation cannot withdraw from a congregation, when that apostasy reached its full-grown stage, you had the Roman Catholic Church. If one congregation cannot withdraw from another congregation, then we as the Lord's Church go back and start fellowshipping the Roman Church and having fellowship in. If not, why not? That's the consequences of a denial of the fact that one church has the biblical authority to withdraw fellowship from a sister congregation. But let me use another illustration. Spring congregation here, doing what the Lord says, being obedient to his command, dealing with the withdrawal of fellowship. And they, because of sin, persistent sin, unrepented of, within an individual's life, withdraw fellowship from that individual. Bible clearly states that responsibility and obligation of the Spring Church of Christ, all churches of Christ. Another individual remains in persistent sin, and another, and another, and another. They refuse to repent on it. And so the Spring Congregation, doing being obedient to what God says, withdraw from each one of them. We would say they are doing exactly what God wants them to do. It's clearly taught within the pages of the New Testament. However, let's just say that all of these individuals now, before the congregation and while the spring elders are working with those individuals, they run over and they start the P congregation, the P Church of Christ. 
Does that mean now then that they are a congregation that has Church of Christ on it, that three elders has to, well, we can't do anything. Again, how foolish of a thought that you can withdraw fellowship as they remain individuals and on an individual basis, but if they get together before you can do that, then you can't do anything about it. And you prevent God's Word from taking place, supposedly, at least. Well, we could talk about these scenarios a great deal, but let's start establishing biblical authority for such. And many of the passages that we're going to deal with have been dealt with in this lectureship, and so I'm not going to spend a great deal of time with them. And basically just want to mention them and apply them in a specific way as far as this lesson is concerned. First, Romans 16, verses 17 and 8, and there's other passages within the the book, and so by the book, uh, it will be advantageous for you. There's a lot of material that just about every speaker will not to in the oral presentation, so by the book. But Paul writes, Now I beseech you, brethren, mark them which cause divisions and offenses contrary to the doctrine which you have learned, and avoid them. For they that are to serve not our Lord Jesus Christ, but their own belly, and by good words and fair speeches the hearts of the simple. These words that have been defined here already, so I'm not going to deal with that, but the question, does this apply only to the marking and avoiding those who are members of the woman congregation? If someone is causing divisions and offenses contrary to the doctrine that is not of the Church of Rome, then does the Church of Rome have to ignore this passage of Scripture? Or does this Scripture apply to that individual as well? Well, let's go a little bit farther. What if it's a congregation that is causing divisions? visions and offenses contrary to the doctrine. Does the church at Rome then have no responsibility to obey this passage because it's congregation? By what reasoning do we and could we conclude that such would be? This doesn't state just the individuals, but it will likewise apply to any of those who are causing offenses and contrary to the doctrine. Divisions contrary to the doctrine. Let's move on to 1 Corinthians 10, verses 20 and 21, where Paul says, But I say that the things which the Gentiles sacrifice, they sacrifice to demons and not to God. I would not that ye should have fellowship with demons. Ye cannot drink the cup of the Lord and the cup of demons. Ye cannot be partakers of the Lord's table and the table of demons. And I changed that from King James Devil to demons because that's what it is technically. Then, What if, and this goes back to the illustration I was using, what if there's a congregation of demons over here? Can the Church of Christ have fellowship with this congregation of demons? Of course not. Is Paul, in stating this, stating this is only applicable if it's an individual, but not a congregation? Some might want to say, oh, well, Michael, you're crazy. Of course we're not going to have fellowship with the Church of Demons. They never were in fellowship with God, and they were never in fellowship with us. Well, let's change it a little bit to say here's this congregation, and it was in fellowship with God, and the other congregation did have fellowship with it, but now then, through time, it becomes the church of demons. Let's 
are we then to say because that fellowship existed at one time, even though now then they are the church of the demons, we fellowship them and continue in fellowship. You cannot have or be partakers of the Lord's table and the table of demons. It would apply to them as well. In Ephesians 5 and verse 11, we're told, have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness. What if the congregation over here is now in that classification of doing the unfruitful works of darkness? Do we continue to have fellowship or do we withdraw our fellowship from it and avoid them? Well, of course, the answers almost become ridiculous in trying to set these things forth. We obviously realize that we would withdraw from them have no fellowship with them, avoid them. But what if it's a congregation? The same principle holds true whether it's a congregation of people or one individual. It does not make any difference. And move on to Second John. I want to spend a little bit more time with Second John. Because we come to that phrase in Second John the doctrine of Christ, and I want to spend some time dealing with the, that phrase, the doctrine of Christ. And as we look at the book, there are four injunctions that are given to us. In verse 5, we are given the injunction to love. I beseech thee, lady, not as though I wrote a new commandment unto thee, but that which he had from the beginning, that we love one another. And so there is an injunction to love. Second, there's the injunction to obedience. That we walk after his commandments. So there's obedience that is enjoined upon us. Third, we see vigilance, the injunction to vigilance, verses 7 through verse 9. To watch because there are many deceivers that are entered into the world that confess not that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh. So there's an injunction to vigilance and then forth an injunction to refusal of error. Verses 11, 10 and 11. That if there comes one unto you and brings not this doctrine, receive him not into your house, neither bidding God speed, for he that biddeth in God speed is partaker of his evil deeds. And so we have, and we start seeing these four injunctions. Back to the aspect of many deceivers are in the world. Deceiver is very simply someone who leads another astray. Someone who corrupts the truth of God's Word. John is mentioning here within his letter and within context one type of deceiver. The emphasis of the book is not that one type of deceiver, but the fact that there are many deceivers. I think many times some forget that aspect. He's dealing with one type of a deceiver, that is, one who denies the fact and the possibility that Jesus came in, or came in the flesh. The agnostic uh, viewpoint. Or, uh, not the agnostic, the Gnosticism viewpoint. We must be vigilant, watchful against, yes, that type of a doctrine, and that type of a doctrine is still around today. But any type of deceptive teaching, teach will lead us astray from God's Word. Why? So that we can enjoy heaven's home. But then in verse 9, we're as to this doctrine of Christ. You all know the passage, so I'm not going to read it again, but what is this doctrine of Christ? There are two main positions dealing with the doctrine of Christ. The first of those is it is an objective genitive. In other words, that is the doctrine about Christ. They would state that the doctrine about the deity of Christ. The other viewpoint is that it is subjective genitive. 
This is the totality of Christ's teaching, that which comes from Christ and his teaching or his doctrine that comes from him. I realize there are some who hold this controversy as to whether it's subjective or objective doesn't make any difference. And then there's some who hold that it actually is both subjective and objective at the same time. I think Brother Denham holds that view, in fact, and a few others. Well, I'm going to present at least a few reasons this morning why I believe it's subject in it. First off is the parallelism of Second John itself. We generally think of the poetry of the Bible as one line and then another line. In synonymous parallelism, one line says something, the second line says second, the same thing in different words. John wrote in parallelism, the only thing is it's not lines, it's sections. And if one section, second section, then another section, and they're saying the same thing, they're using different words in order to express those same thoughts. Look if, at you, if you will, at some phrases. Starting in verse 1. Well, they that have known the, notice the word in verse 1. For the truth sake, verse 2. Uh, verse 3, again, we see truth emphasized in truth and love. Verse 4, again, the word truth. Walking in truth. So we have an emphasis on the word truth. Then, starting in verse 4, we have the word change from truth to commandment. As we have received a commandment, verse 4. Verse 5, uh, as though I wrote a new commandment unto you. And verse 6, that we walk after his commandments. So you have the word commandment. But is that any different than truth? No, it's the same thing, just expressed in different words. Then we come down to verse 9 and verse 10, and you have the word doctrine. Same thing as truth, same thing as commandments. Just a different term is being used to express the same idea. And so the very thrust of the letter shows that he's dealing with all of the commandments that Jesus Christ set forth. But then a second reason is John's emphasis on commandment keeping. This is emphasized within this book. Notice verse 2, that the dwelleth in us, the truth sake which dwelleth in us. Again in verse 2, shall be with us forever. Again, this is an emphasis on keeping the truth, commandment keeping. Verse 3, John found her children walking in truth. Verse 4, we have received a commandment. Verse 6, that we walk in love and walking after his commandment. So love is the looking after his commandment. Verse 8, he tells us, look to yourselves. Why? So that we don't lose the reward or that we will receive a full reward. What is that? That's heaven's home, but how are we going to receive reward? Only by walking in truth. Commandment keeping. And so the whole thrust of the letter becomes obey God's will keeping the commands. And see verse 9, those who abide in the doctrine of Christ have God. Those who do not abide in it do not have God. You can also look at John's emphasis in other books. John 14, verse 15, verse 21, verse 23 through 24. John 15, 1 John. So many times in 1 John, but verses five, uh, chapter 5, verse 2 and 3, that we love God, and this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments, and his not grief. 
John has a continual emphasis, not only in 2 John, but all of the books that he writes on commandment keeping. Third reason is grammar itself. And I realize that the grammar of the passage could be either one, objective or subjective. But just a few verses earlier in verse 6, you have the same type of construction. This is love that we walk after the phrase, his commandments can be translated the commandments of him. Or the command of Christ. Same type of construction, yet we recognize in verse 6 that it's all of God's commandments, all of Christ's commandments, the commandments that come from him and not the commandment about Christ and his deity. Why not remain consistent in verse 9 and hold the same thing? We had to look at parallel passages. Matthew, the 16th chapter, for example. Jesus tells his apostles, Take heed and beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and of the Sadducees. They have this understanding, and so Jesus corrects them. In verse 12, it says, Then understand how that he bade them not be aware of the leaven of the dead, but of the doctrine of the Pharisees and of the Sadducees. Is the doctrine of the Pharisees and the doctrine of the Sadducees the doctrine about the Pharisees and Sadducees? Or the doctrine which comes from them? Obviously, it's doctrine which comes from them. And their teaching that they're, that they're setting. And you beware of that. In Acts 2 and verse 42, and here's the church they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine. That phrase, apostles' doctrine, is the doctrine of the apostles. Now, and is that the doctrine about the apostles? Did they continue in the doctrine about what the apostles were and their nature? Well, of course not. It's the to which they gave. And so parallel passages show that. Another reason to believe that this is teaching that comes from Christ Christ is the entirety of the Bible's, uh, Bible's teaching on the limits of worship. In reality, I can only think of one reason to think that this phrase, doctrine of Christ, is the doctrine of Christ. And that is to broaden the limits of Christian fellowship. What these individuals generally want to do is take the view that this is objective genitive, it is the doctrine about Christ and his deity, is to broaden the limits of fellowship so that we can fellowship the Christian church and eventually fellowship denominations. Why they believe that Jesus is God and we can fellowship them. They have God, although we might not be able to a little left fellowship them as Lubel Shelley now teaches. It's interesting, he used to teach this as being subjective genitive and then change objective genitive when he made his change to start accepting into his fellowship, his big F fellowship at least, all the denominations. Now, that's exactly what you have and the reason why you go to a object of genitive, or this is only the doctrine about Christ and not his teachings. Well, when we start saying this, then he teaches if one comes into your house and brings not this doctrine, and receive not your house, neither bidding God's speed. For he that bidding in God's speed is partaker of his evil deeds. God's speed is very simply a greeting. That's the meaning of the term there, a greeting. Uh, he's indicating you do not do anything in any way that could be interpreted by that individual, by other individuals, as giving support and aid to that individual who is not abiding with Christ's. And if you do, then you become a partaker of his evil deeds. Can I change that for just a second from specifically my subject of one congregation to another congregation to here's an organization out here that puts someone in that's false teacher 
Now then, when other individuals fellowship that false teacher, they become a partaker of his evil deeds. When Apologetics Press elevated Dave Miller to the directorship of Apologetics Press, those who continued to fellowship Apologetics Press and Dave Miller be partaker of his sin and his wickedness. And brethren, why is it that some all of a sudden perverting the organization of the Lord's church and the authority of elders is no longer a fellowship matter? That it's just something now not to divide the church of Christ, the beautiful bride of Christ. Well, who made that decision? A few individuals who wanted to hang on to Apologetics Press and Dave Miller, not what the cost. Some, and it's been discussed a little bit here, accuse us of this A to Z fellowship. When someone begins extending fellowship to that false teacher, Dave Miller, and they defend him, they, in effect, become the same as he. They become in that A position and if you want to use that A to Z type terminology because of events, they become a partaker of his evil deeds. But somehow, most fair-minded brethren have determined that he's not a false teacher. Doesn't matter that he perverted the worship of the church, or the organization of the church. Doesn't matter that he split a congregation, Brown Trail congregation. Oh, but it happened ten years ago. When did time ever to sin? Well, there's more material in the book, but my time is about up. This is an important subject. It's something that we have not practiced the way that we should. And other congregations and individuals many times are caught on the because a congregation will not mark and withdraw from a congregation within their area that they have dealings with and have had dealings with They've not done what God wants us to do as far as marking and withdrawing from those who have become apostate. Yes, even patients that are such. Thank you for your attention. Well, thank you, Brother Michael. Appreciate that so very much. I was sort of interested in the unsprung or spring. <laughs> I think I, uh, I missed up my punch. I was going to say the sprung congregation. The, uh, the spring and the unspring. Well, who knows what people say about, about us nowadays, but as long as the Lord's happy with us, that's all I care about. And I know the way that that works. So just know your Bible and honestly obey it, and you'll be acceptable to God. That seems rather simple to me, but that's not the way a lot of people view it. Let's be mindful of these things and do our best to not allow our own preconceived notions, dislikes, whatever, to cause us to see the Bible for what it really has to say on any subject. And that's very important that we do that. We've had uh, around 650, uh, how would you say it, strike hits, I guess that's the word, unique hits, okay. 150 on um, tuning in to the lectureship, and we welcome all those who are on the internet listening. And we had before this started, a few minutes before, we had about four seven this morning already tuned in. So we're very happy to be able to put the lectureship out in that format.
to be dismissed now for about 11 or so minutes and come back at the top of the hour for our next lecture. Thank you.